Okay, once again, now we've taken the individual weights, we've mounted them, and again, from big to small, that's rather important, and then we take the two halves, we're going to set them up, slide them together, we're just going to park them off the end, keep them out of the way so we don't drop test them on the floor. Now, from there, what I've done is I've laid these things out on their profile. In other words, there's a 125, excuse me, a 250, a 125, and I've got six more of them. Plus, we have the 10-gram shims laid out, and in fact, we have the 1-gram shims. So, as we grab the bodies, we would just go ahead and be redundant. And I'm just going to skip through this, but we'll note that on the clock, because we know exactly how long it takes us to do this. So, let's move to the next exercise. Alright, we've completed the bob weights, and basically, to assemble everything, it's going to take about a minute apiece. Now, you can see we just laid them out here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and take the mounting nuts, along with, quite frankly, just a pocket ruler, and I'm going to lay these down so that I have access to them when I put the bob weights onto the crankshaft. But before we mount them, we're going to talk about letting the computer know what type of crank it is and what its specific dimensions are that are required for us to do the analysis. Cut. Alright, when we first mount the crankshaft up, the only thing we really have to do is we have to ensure that the oil hole will straddle the glide blocks. So we just position that and you can move these stanchions left or right, but at this point, there's a couple ways we could have gone about it. In this particular deal, we already have a memory for this program, so if I just go down here and I call up 3024 and hit load, it'll automatically put the setup numbers in there so I can look and it's seven or 19.25 inches for the bearing spread. So I can just come over here and well, voila, there we are. Now, if we didn't know that and we were talking about a new input, what we would do is we would first come up here and we would ask for a new job. And again, just for the sake, I'm going to call this test and we'll call it test three. And hit enter, and then right at the bottom here it says test three, and it's letting me know that it, it brought in the numbers that were already on the screen. So we would challenge those. Now what I mean by challenging, and I'm just going to simply go in and test this, and I'm going to measure from the first station from the center to center, and sure enough, of course, it's 19.25, but if it was something different, you would merely just touch here, it'll bring up a keypad, and again, it's telling you bearing to bearing, you put 19.25 and hit enter. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to go over to the radius. Now, what is the radius? The radius is half the distance of diameter, but in our particular application, we want to know where the correction radius is. In other words, from the center of the crank to the outside edge, because that's where the drill is going to contact. Now, there's a couple ways you could have done this. One, you could just hang it over the top, look down, and you can say, hey, that's pretty straightforward, three inches. The other one is these blocks are exactly seven inches in width, so we know that half of that would be 3.5, and I could come in from the edge and just do the quick math and you can see the half inch in, so I know that's three inch. And again, we would touch over here and just put in three. If for some reason, let's say the other side was different, I'm just going to show you here that, let's say it was eight inches. Well, I just log it in as eight. In reality, we know it's three inches also because the counterweights on an automotive application are generally going to be the same. Very rare will you ever find them different. The other thing you have to pay attention here is is that this unit is used, for instance, if we were doing a measurement on the outside, I can go ahead and tell it what that dimension would be, and we call it the left radius, and it's called six. Oops, back up there, say six. And what it will do is it will think it's doing a correction somewhere in this zone. Like all computers, bad data in will give you bad data out, so you have to pay just a little bit of attention. Now, i us send this back to three, so we know we're good here. The next thing we have here is the plane. Now, in this case, we call it the left plane because it's the left side of the crank. And you go from the center of the stanchion coming horizontal until you find the correction point. Let's call it the drill hole. So I can merely come over here and just take a quick measurement with the ruler. And it's, in this case, 1.375. So I'm going to go over here, 1.375, and enter. On the right side, again, I go from what, and again, we define this as the home stanchion. But I'm going to come across and I'm going to say, all right, this unit is sitting there in 19 inches. Excuse me, 17 inches. So 17, and enter. Again, we have tolerance. This is a street job, street performance. We'll say 0.5. And then I would hit save. So all of that data is set up for this job using those parameters. 
again, if I had to, I could go back up here, I could pull up 302, load it. Now, the difference is you notice everything the same except for tolerance. That's because on test three, the job that I logged in there, I set that at 0.5. And if you recall, I'm going to go back here and find test three by scrolling down, bring it up, and there it is again, 0.5. So you can see by selecting the program, we don't have to remember all these numbers. We build what we call a core program. That's a 302 Ford. Now I would then bring that in, and I could come up here and change the name to anything I wanted. It could be uh, your job ticket number. It could be the customer's name. It could be anything you want. But once you log that in, it basically accepts those parameters, logs in, but pay attention all of your bob weight information is gone because it thinks it's brand new. If we go back here now, and we go to 302 Ford, which is what we were playing with, you can see there's all our original numbers that we have played with. So, again, we're on 302 Ford, everything's in place. So now we've got all of our dimensions, the machine's ready to go. There's only one other thing we need to do. Right here you see the enunciation at RPM. Well, RPM, first what we would do is we would start here and I'm just going to set it up at 200 RPM. Now notice, I do not have any bob weights on here. This thing is extremely unbalanced. So what I'm going to try and do is just go in and spin so that I can check for the belt track. If the belt is forward or aft, I can just reach down here and I can adjust the belt forward and aft so it runs in the center of the main. And is that a safe enough RPM? You notice it's starting to analyze. Now it will, this machine will analyze at 200 RPM and the advantage to that is we might want to take a course measurement just because we know nothing about this bad boy. So as it's running, we're just going to let it sample. And once it has collected enough data, it's going to shut down. Now what's important to understand is, is that if you spin this at the normal 500 RPM, it's so far out of balance, it could become unsafe, and that's the purpose of the safety straps. Right now, this particular application is showing 951.78 grams of unbalance on this side. On this side, it's showing 949.59 grams. Trust me, if that's found at 500 RPM, it would try and chase you around the room. So it's a bad idea.